Can you host we, Jen in case I need to um, just bail. So. Yeah. Does that does that mean that we can't even have a presentation? That that is true. We shouldn't have presentations if there's not a quorum of the of the commission. Yeah. Okay. That's unless, too bad. unless Laura can show up. If Laura can make it, then we might still be able to. Right. Her plane. She emailed me. She said, "I will read." <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jen, my flight lands at 7.30 and I will join then, but I'll be participating from the car. Okay. So. Seems like a bit of a stretch. Yeah, it's a Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So maybe Dave has a long report. I do on tonight, but well, we can always chat. Yeah, so. Let me just get this started, <laughs> then we'll announce what's going on. So welcome to the October 12th meeting of the Amherst Massachusetts Conservation Commission. Um, I just wanna announce at the top here, I see we have four people in attendance. It seems like we are not gonna have a quorum for this meeting, um, which means we don't have a majority of the commissioners and we can't hear anything on any of our hearings. So all of the hearings scheduled for tonight will be continued to our next meeting, which is on October 20, 12 plus 14, 26th. <laughs> um, so two weeks from tonight. Um, so I'm sorry about this. This was unanticipated. Usually we have a good idea what's going on, but um, we're, we're struggling here. COVID has hit the commission. So um, yeah, and we're sorry about this, but please tune in again on October 26th and look for the agenda posted online before the meeting for the timing of the hearings. Um, we're gonna go about some business, hearing an update from Dave and um, Aaron and um, probably at waiting to see if we get another commissioner join, to join, in which case uh, we could technically hear updates on a couple of our hearings um, and at the very least, one of us will be staying on to announce the continuations at the times of the scheduled times of the hearings. Um, but just to let attendees know what's going on. Very unlikely at this point that we'll have any content in any of the hearings tonight. We're likely to continue all of them. Um, so with that, that is my update. <laughs> um, Dave, would you like to go ahead Give us any updates. Sure, I wish I had more, more content tonight. Um, but a couple of quick updates for the commission. And, and again, if, if there's air time to fill, we can please feel free to ask me questions um, around the edges. So, um, you know, just to remind the commission and anyone in the audience that we are rededicating the Emily Dickinson Trail this Saturday, uh, the 15th at 10 a.m. at Groff Park. Uh, this is a collaborative project with the Fort River uh, Watershed Association, as well as the Connecticut River Conservancy, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There has been two um, new kiosks installed uh, at either end of the Emily Dickinson Trail. There will be eight to ten new uh, QR code posts, if you will, stations along the trail that um, have been permitted by the commission. And those, um, each one of those stations, those, those places for folks to stop and ponder the Fort River will include additional information if you follow the QR code on everything from wildlife, fisheries, um, uh, geology, and, and many others. So that's 10 a.m. on Saturday down on the lower level of Groff Park, um, right at the, the trailhead at the Emily Dickinson Trail. So, that should be exciting. I know that Mindy Dom, our state rep, uh, the chair of the um, select, excuse me, the president of the, I almost said chair of the select board, the, the president of the council will be there as well as uh, our town manager. I am going to be out of town, so I, I will not be there, but um, anyone else is welcome to attend. Let's see, um, <clears throat> a project that the commission, um, permitted some time ago, uh, will be getting underway later in October. This is the culvert, the crushed culvert replacement at the, the um, uh, Plum, Plumbrook Pond. 
near the Kestrel office. We have bid that project out and we have a successful bidder from um, Belchertown who will be doing that project. This is, uh, there's two crushed culverts on one of the um, 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 uh, inflow streams to the, the pond. And so we're really excited to get this work done. They'll be of course um, working with Aaron on a pre-construction meeting, uh, working with the Kestrel Trust and, and us to make sure that, you know, there'll be a, a short disruption in the use of that trail, probably three to five days that people will not be able to make the loop. But um, it's a wonderful project. And those culverts have probably been in there since the 1960s and water damage and, and filled with sediment and probably beaver damage as well. So, and rust and, and everything else. So it's great to get those out of there. The, uh, the final treatment over that small stream will actually be a bridge now. So the two crushed culverts will be removed and a nice walking bridge. So um, another way to kind of enhance the uh, Plumbrook Pond. Uh, Dave, sorry, I see that Mark just joined the meeting and he is the 47, I think he's the applicant's representative for 47 Olympia Drive. Mark, um, I don't think we're gonna have a quorum tonight. So it's likely we're gonna have to continue until our next meeting on October 26th. Um, we're doing some commission business and waiting to see if one additional commissioner joins, in which case we could at least have a presentation on the project, um, but this will be a continuation no matter what at this point. So Mark, I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, thanks, sorry, Dave, sorry for the interruption. Sure. Um, the only other quick update, I know that the land use policy rules and regulations is working its way through the commission. It might have landed with me. Erin might be able to chime in here. I know she and I have not connected this week and likely won't, um, but early next week we will, and we'll get that moving out through the commission again. Um, I think it's in pretty, you know, pretty good shape, lots of good good uh, comments from the individual commission members. Um, I will say that um, two things that came up this week that I think are, are relevant are the issues of kind of reoccurring, reoccurring events uh, or events where say we have a relationship with, and, you know, as an example with Kestrel Trust, um, you know, for them to do educational programs around Plumbrook Pond. Um, it seems rather inefficient and probably foolish to have them come through and say, you know, we want to do saw wet owl banding every year and have them, you know, come through the commission, take your valuable time. We could be spending on kind of other, other priorities. Likewise, the Fort River Farm, you know, uh, community gardens, if they want to have an event down there. So they're, you know, as we talk more about land use, I think there are a couple of options. One is to go, as Michelle may have recommended, um, toward MOUs with these, these organizations that have long-term relationships with the town through the commission and the, and the staff. The other option is that there are, I think, certain cases where kind of an administrative approval uh, might be fine. It, you know, if there are just, you know, no impacts, you know, somebody wants to come out and do a, a one-time plant survey, um, and and they they need to, you know, they need to get on the land quickly because the plant is going to flower or whatever. I'm kind of making this up as I, as I go along, but you get my my drift here. So I think we can talk about that in the in the context of land use policy. So um, I think um, we'll we'll keep that moving through. Um, there was another, yeah, there was another thing that came up this week, which was interesting on land use, since we have a couple of minutes, a gentleman came into my office and asked oh. about, asked about trapping, which is interesting. Did somebody else join us or? Yeah, uh, Alex had a question. I just didn't know if oh, it yeah. was on the past comment, mm -hmm. past topic or not. <laughs> so I think you're muted, Alex. You're still muted. We can't hear you. I'll okay. pause while David talks about this subject. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Um, so the other one that came in this week was interesting. A gentleman asking about uh, trapping on public land in Amherst, town land. And 
you may recall about 15 years ago, leg hold traps were outlawed, um, but box traps are still legal, which I didn't realize. So for some mammals, you can box trap um, mammals. So I think it's one I you know, sent out to Aaron and we can add it to the list. We allow fishing, we allow hunting. Currently we allow fishing, we allow hunting. Um, do we allow, should we allow as a, as a town, a community, uh, the trapping of certain mammals uh, for their fur, essentially, it's not to catch and release. This is for, um, you know, the, the harvesting of, of pelts. So it's, it's just interesting. A more what is the target, Dave? Is it beaver? Um, it could be beaver, it could be raccoon, uh, it could be mink, I suppose. Otter, Bobcat, otter. otters. Yeah. yeah, there's a certain there's there there are certain mammals that are allowed under state law to be trapped in these, you know, live trapped, and then the the animal is euthanized, and then the pellet is harvest uh, the pelt is harvested. So um, interesting. I had just never had that question come to us. So anyway, um, so it is legal in Massachusetts. So presumably right now it is legal to do this on town land. But the commission needs to decide whether that's something you want to do in the long term, have and uh, have available. So it would be interesting uh, if that subject was a referendum on a ballot during an election, how the town of Amherst would vote. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's just all of this brings up a lot of safety concerns, too. Um, yeah. Well, kind of again, these are, uh, you know, these traps are safety for for people or i mean yeah i mean i was they're just essentially thinking. they're essentially have a heart traps oh okay yeah no, no kind of kind of bears are legal there's lots of lethal traps that are legal i don't we'll have to check that alex i don't i think massachusetts outlawed most of those about 15 years ago well that's how so. beaver are caught um uh, uh maybe by a licensed trapper but i don't I don't think well, you can't trap without a license. Yeah, I, I don't think. But with a hunting license, you can trap them. You yeah, need a trapping can, license yeah. issued by the state. Yeah, right. Uh, with yeah. a trapping license for beaver, you can trap them. Yeah, we should. Yeah, we should clarify all of this because it does bring up these these questions for sure. I'd be happy to do some homework on it. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. So, Dave, um, the last time you talked about the land use plan you gave us an idea of what you were after. And as I recall, what you said is you wanted the um, policy to document status quo. And my comment to Aaron about that is I haven't been here on the commission long enough to know what status quo is. So <clears throat> um, I wasn't quite sure what I could offer other than changing which to that, which I would tend not to do. So, and then you said we'd like to then dig deeper to see where the policy might want to go. And I'd be interested in, in that. But I, I don't know enough about status quo to provide worthwhile comments. Well, no, I think I think that's accurate, Alex. I think what we talked about was was kind of codifying what we currently have. And, you know, in the short term, i.e., like let's let's get this all done you know, this year, and we'll, we'll know what, what the current rules, regulations, policies are on Amherst conservation, governing uh, 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 Amherst conservation land, and then take a look and say, okay, how do we want to approach this long term? I'll give you a great example. So, and, and the reason for that, some of that is efficiency, and some of the fact is that if we... <laughs> We're going to take a long-term look at things. Um, it's going to take some time. So, looking at uh, what is the commission's policy on uh, rental of agricultural conservation land that could be used for agriculture? That's a pretty in-depth conversation. We should have it. Uh, the commission had it about ten years ago and developed a policy on that. And that policy is part of the document that Aaron has has pulled together. Um, compiled for the commission to review. The dog policy, for instance, has been uh, looked at many times through the years and has uh, 
uh, garnered some some controversy through the years um, when that was proposed to be changed. So I think what I wanted to do is bring it all together. We agreed this is these are the current rules, regulations, policies governing Amherst Conservation Land, and then say, okay, let's organize those into categories and then say, which ones would we like to take a deeper dive on? I think we can all probably agree that open fires, that alcohol, that um, glass containers at Puffer's Pond, there's some kind of low hanging fruit here that I think is fairly easy to tick through. What are, you know, um, but as you go a little deeper, you know, even in Puffer's Pond, what are, you know, are we, uh, what about, um, you know, um, you know, the, the I know historically there has been a, a regulation about playing loud music at Puffer's Pond, where dogs are allowed on at Puffer's Pond or not, upstream. So there's a number of areas we can dig a little deeper in, and I think that'll take some time. So I think um, let's get them all together. Let's agree these are the historically what past commissions have, have, uh, um, have approved. And then we'll look at those and say, all right, let's take some time in 23 to really dig into those areas that the commission would like to focus on. And then other ones, I think we can just kind of tick off and say, yes, 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 yes. But let's take a deeper dive on, you know, for instance, agricultural rentals. Um, perhaps you'll want to take a look at dog policy. I don't know. Um, just to touch on this quickly, the... Um land use policy as it currently is drafted is in the OneDrive. And um, I was actually hoping, Cameron, if you want to have a look at it this week, um, like say between if you could finish up looking at it by next Wednesday. And again, there's no pressure to modify anything if you just want to read through it and kind of get a sense of things. But if anything jumps out at you where you say, oh, you know, we should change this or whatever, feel free to put a comment in there. And then once you finish up next Wednesday, um, if you have any changes, let me know. If you don't have any changes, let me know. And then Alex can have a week to have a look at it before our next meeting. Um, yeah, I did look at it before this meeting, but not oh. in depth for edits. So I'll, I'll do that. And Carmen, don't hesitate just because like this, Alex, this goes for you too. I mean, so Dave is saying like, let's get this in writing and get it done. And then we'll come back and revisit some of the issues that either haven't been revisited a while or tend, you know, tend to come up often. But again, you guys have fresh perspectives, which we could really benefit from. I mean, we've all been, you know, or a lot, or I guess I have been here for a while. Fletcher's been here for a while. Dave's been here for a while. So if you have fresh perspective, um, it's more than welcome. Um, so do not be shy, certainly. And Alex, I can tell you're not shy. So. <laughs> it, should be, it should be kind of it should be fun i mean you know there's some yeah there's some interesting and complex yeah. issues you know camping you know years ago the commission allowed camping on the mount Holyoke range with a permit weddings on mount pollux were allowed with 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 a permit if you will and rather large weddings so there's there's all these areas to kind of dig a little deeper on and um, fees. Do we charge fees for certain activities on conservation land? Things of that sort. So I think it should be I think I think it should be fun um, and and really kind of challenging to intellectually to kind of go through these things and figure out what and we can also talk to other communities and see what's worked in other communities um, and what hasn't worked. So yeah. We're so unique in the amount of conservation land we have. It'll be interesting to try to find an analog. I mean, mm -hmm. well, there may be there may be things that we do that are similar. For instance, there are a number of communities in Eastern Mass that actually um, lease out a lot of their land. I'm thinking Lincoln, Sudbury, mm. um, um, uh, Natick, Newton, Needham, um, in that area. Um, oh, really? Okay. There's a lot of farms uh, that, that really operate a, a 501c3 on conservation land. Mm -hmm. And that land is basically leased to them long term and has mm -hmm. been for years. So, you know, what are some of the models out there that, um, that we think might, might work here in Amherst? So. Yeah, that's great. Um, I just want to make an announcement really quick. Uh, if you're here, in attendance for the meeting and planning to listen in on some of the hearings. 
I can say with a great degree of confidence at this point that we are not going to have a quorum of the commissioners for this hearing, for this meeting. So all of our hearings that are on the agenda will be continued to our next meeting on October 26th. Um, so I would encourage you to come back um, for the hearings on the 26th <clears throat> and keep an eye on the agenda posted online before the meeting to see what time specifically those will, those hearings will be. But if you're here in attendance as a member of the public or an applicant's representative for any of the hearings happening tonight, is very unlikely we'll have any content covered in any of those hearings. They will all be continued. Um, so just FYI. Sorry, thanks, Dave. I just don't want anyone to sit around. No, that's fine. Those were the only quick updates. I'm happy to take any any questions? We're continuing to do, um, you know, early successional management with with uh, brush hogging, and um, actually, field staff is taking a little much needed um, vacation right now. So for the next week or ten days, it's a little bit slow. But uh, Brad and Tyler, the other thing I would just announce is that um, we're we're planning to have both Brad and Tyler come in and do a presentation. Um, my goal would be to have it maybe be at the second meeting in uh, January. Um, first or second meeting in January to kind of do kind of a 2022 summary of what projects they worked on, um, where some of the successes were, where some of the challenges, um, and um, we want to get them coming before you on a more regular basis. My goal would be to have them do a quarterly um, update for you in a PowerPoint uh, form, talk about trail work, um, talk about other things they're working on, and, and really get them a little experience um, presenting to you and, and get commission members to get to know Brad and Tyler. Yeah, I look forward to these meetings in the quieter, supposedly quieter months when things are frozen. Right. Although I feel like we didn't have quiet months last year, so maybe this year. <laughs> um, did you have a question or comment? Or Alex? Yeah. Aaron? I was just gonna say, um, there was two items on the agenda specifically, and I don't know if Dave wants to touch on them. One was the CPA funding request, mm -hmm. um, and the mm -hmm. other was um, Dave and I had talked offline um, about, I know Michelle had started a, sort of some questions pertaining to um, field mowing a couple weeks ago, and and it prompted a discussion with Dave and I about sort of our process for field mowing and that we may in the future want to um, establish in the not so distant future establish like a committee to look at our policy for land management similar to what we did for um i'll let you talk dave because I can't yeah, yeah, speak. No, no. so very very briefly no this is spot on um yeah and it, it goes to alex's earlier question so I think the idea would be that it would be much more efficient if a subcommittee of the commission took this on in 2023. We codify everything, we get everything in one document. Here's what we currently do. Here's what uh, past uh, what past practices have been for the department and the commission uh, across the board from agricultural licenses, uh, leases, uh, uh, puffers pond, trails, hunting, fishing, trapping, et cetera. Um, get that all in one place and then see what we have at that point. And then um, a subcommittee like the, you know, the, the wetlands regulation and bylaw subcommittee could really dig into these much deeper and then, um, you know, kind of bring the, the full commission along through reports, uh, you know, um, by meeting or by month in 23. And again, uh, Michelle, Michelle, I think, was 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 stimulated by this idea uh, in talking about you know what are what are our current practices with regard to early successional habitat management for grassland birds, pollinators, um, and and the like. Um, also putting a putting a, a a a lens on with regard to um, you know um, global climate change and you know all of these activities that we undertake have a carbon footprint. Um, so whether we're buying, you know, extensively buying lumber for for trails and trail work, or 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 mowing, um, you know, 200, 300 acres of early successional habitat, what are some of the implications of that long term? So, 
And do we want to keep doing that? Are there some early successional fields that maybe uh, we we let go and 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 uh, enjoy succession for the next you know 20, 30 years until they're you know uh, um, going to be what they want to be, um, depending on their location and soils and whatnot. So. So yeah, I think a subcommittee makes a lot of sense in terms I do of too. It seems yeah. to be a more the, our most efficient mode of operating. Um, it just went so well for the bylaws. It kind of keeps things moving. Yeah. Um, in terms of CPA funding, I did put in a, a request for a hundred thousand dollars to the CPA committee. That's actually the largest ask I've ever had for a non um, a non acquisition project. I put that in, you know with some cautious optimism there's certainly a hundred thousand dollars worth of trails bridges and other work we need to do out there um, we're finding that the cost of, of of materials is like anyone whether you're building a house or a garage or doing anything is skyrocketing so uh to build a, a simple footbridge or a more complex bridge you know might be eight thousand dollars now or ten thousand dollars so $100,000 really doesn't go that far when you're maintaining uh, 80 miles of trails. So um, the CPA committee will kick off their work. I believe their first meeting uh, with presentations, I believe is on November 10th. Um, and um, of course, I think Michelle is the your representative to that committee. Yep. While we're chatting, I, I, I do know that there are a couple of APR, agricultural preservation restriction, applications into the state. Um, these are um, owners of land off of Southeast Street, um, south, very much south toward Bay Road. Um, a couple of farmers have at least applied for um, APR funding. I'm gonna find out more. I, I have some, some cursory information about the applications, but we're meeting with uh, one or both of those farmers in the next week or 10 days. So I'll have more for you at your next meeting. Um, and there are certainly some farms, as you look at our conservation map, there are some farms in South Amherst that are that are not in the APR program and, and certainly do have some prime soils and are part of blocks of, of already protected conservation land or agricultural land. So, yeah. so we'll have more on that at your next meeting. Okay. Um, I, it's 7.30, so I think I can make the announcement about the first, continuing the first hearing. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say 7.30 PM, um, the notice of intent SWCA for 52 Fearing Street LLC for the relocation construction of single family house with associated site work in preparation in the 100 foot, foot buffer zone to BVW at 46 Fearing Street um, will be continued to uh, October 26th at 7.30 PM. Um, and again, if you're here as a member of the, of the public, um, looking forward to hearing any, oh, we have a Laura. That's interesting. Laura, are you there? I'm here, yes. Okay. Is this a, um, sustainable for you to participate? Because we, you make a quorum for us. So it's pivotal <laughs> whether or not. <laughs> I, I I can fully participate. I've reviewed the materials, but I will be driving. So that is your decision. I wrote you that an email. Yeah, yes. I did know that you would be taking this as a call. At that time, I did not know you would be the pivotal member for a quorum. Um, and I note in the attendees, we've lost a few people. Yeah, because we thought there was a very good chance that we wouldn't have a quorum. Um, Laura, we weren't banking on your flight being on time. <laughs> Uh, how should we, what's the best bet here, Dave? Mm. Um, I also noticed I, that when I said that there was a chance we would not have a quorum, um, the representative for 47 Olympia Drive just dropped off immediately. I, oh. I would defer to Aaron, but I'm inclined to continue because we have lost, you know, we had six or seven attendees. I don't know all of their associated, you know, but Aaron, do you have any advice for us? Yeah, I mean, the only thing that was really super critical for tonight was um, uh, the 
there was a, a diesel spill at the um, Podic substation and there was an emergency certification issued and I was hoping that that would be ratified tonight. Um, I know Melissa Cody left the call. She emailed me. Um, I just messaged her and asked if she could rejoin, but um, you know, we, um, we'll see if she gets the message or not. If not, um, then we can just carry on with continuances and um, who, so it, Melissa Cody is involved in the emergency cert. Yeah. She's the, okay. um, contact from Ty and bond who, uh, okay. who facilitated getting the emergency certification for the cleanup out there. Um, okay. That was done this week. So would you not feel comfortable ratifying? I mean, ratifying it without her input. I mean, I reviewed the emergency oh, cert. Yeah, I mean, you guys can. She was just going to give a little presentation. Um, I, she jo she okay. left right as Laura was joining. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, we can we can certainly talk about it. Um, and you guys can vote on it. That that would be completely fine. That would actually be a good thing for us to tick off the list for the next meeting, so that we're not, yeah. you know, too overwhelmed at the next meeting with other business. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, let's give us 30 more seconds. We'll continue the um, RDA for New England Central Railroad. That's at 735. And then we'll discuss the emergency cert. Yeah, and relative to the New England Central Railroad, as long as, I mean, it's not, I'll just kind of give a little update while we're waiting for the hearing to hearing time to approach. Um, and actually I can, give you a little bit of information on 46 fairing that um they may be coming back to join us i'm not i'm not entirely sure i know they're doing some site due diligence right now um but i'll keep you posted if if any um if any information comes in that indicates that that hearing is going to move forward I'll, I'll let you guys know right away okay. um the um railroad project the issue was they were trying to get around doing a butter notices they did yeah. reach out to Paul Bockelman to try to see if um, Paul would sort of try to override the commission in terms of requiring a butter notices for the RDA and Paul said no I can't do that so um, they did request another continuation I'm starting to feel a little uneasy with the number of continuations and this is the same thing that happened the last time we had a railroad rda and they like never showed up to a single hearing and ultimately the commission couldn't get questions answered yeah so um i do think at some point and maybe tonight's not the night but at some point we should say okay kind of enough's enough with the ongoing continuing continuations and that at some Can point a decision needs to be made i think and we've done this before uh, yeah, yeah not and i don't mean a decision on the application i mean a decision relative to the public hearing like are we going to require a republication of the legal ad and tell them you need to notify a butters and then we'll reopen the hearing from scratch or you know something to that effect as opposed to voting on the rda because it's technically not even really a public hearing if they had the abutters haven't been notified yep yeah, so let me go ahead and continue that hearing. So um, the 7.30, the hearing, the request for determination scheduled for 7.35 p.m. Keith Morris on behalf of New England Central Railroad Company for verification of sensitive area locations along the New England Central Railroad right-of-way. Um, it's the right-of-way extending from Leverett to Bel Belchertown. That hearing will be continued for now um, till October 26th at 7.35 p.m. Um, so Aaron, do you want to just, do you have the energy to give us an overview of that emergency cert for the diesel spill? And we could at least. Yeah, um, let me, bear with me just one moment and I'm gonna pull up the, um, <clears throat> the you want information. want me to share just... something? Um, no, that's okay. I'm, okay. If, if I have a, an angry baby that wakes up, I'll jump off, but I think I'll be able to get just a view of what's going on here for you quickly. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, 
Oh, you know what? Um, I can't share, Jen. Could you? You yeah. have to make me remake me a co-host. Oh. Um. How do I do that? Me co-host. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so this is the general information, October 14th, um, an unknown volume of diesel was, um, released from a Sunbelt Rentals mobile generator that had been staged on timber matting outside the Podic substation at 325 Sunderland Road, based on the unknown volume, um, Eversource, um, uh, contacted DEP Bureau of Waste Site Cleanup, um, and they were issued a release tracking number. Uh, they identified a 40 foot by 40 foot area of grass underneath the um, uh, timber mat and the soil that they wanted to basically excavate. And the sketch below shows that location. Um, this is locally jurisdictional bordering land subject to flooding. It is not um, mapped 100 year flood zone, but um, there has been evidence of ponding in this area. And so, um, and it also is in a buffer zone. So just FYI. Um, they requested the emergency certification to remove 25 cubic yards of soil on the west side of the substation. Um, Again, uh, isolate. Oh, sorry, isolated land subject to flooding under the Amherst Wetland Bylaw. A hundred foot buffer zone to the north also impacted the site. Um, and see, there they took the material in a in a dumpster to be analyzed off site. Um, and once they received the laboratory analysis, they'll have a better sense of what happened. They um, plan to restore the area with mulch mulch seed straw. Um, and then install temporary erosion controls. And that was basically the reason for the emergency cert. And so the emergency cert was, was granted to Eversource for 325 Sunderland Road. I signed it and it just needs to be ratified um, by a motion and vote of the commission. And I'll make a motion, yeah. Jen, do you want me to make a motion or do you want discussion? <laughs> well, so Laura, what you can't see is that Laura, we just lost Laura. Um, I don't know if she lost her internet. No, I, oh, I'm we, here. We lost Jen. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, we Jen. lost Jen is what I meant to say. Sorry, we lost Jen. Sorry. Wow, this is a, we're all a little bit of a hot mess tonight, aren't we? Okay. <laughs> Let's see if- She's Christian back. She's very back. back. Sorry, my internet just totally dropped out. So I just presented and Laura yeah. was on the verge of making a motion, but I said, we lost Jen. So just pause for a second. So, yeah, sorry. Jen, uh, Laura, you can jump right back in. Yeah, my question is if you want me to make a motion um, or if you want to have any sort of discussion, Jen. I'm comfortable with this. I think the right call was made. This was the right thing to approve an emergency cert for this. The sooner they do the work or have done yeah. the work, the better. I agree. Um, so do you, so I'm just going to uh, make a motion to approve the emergency certification. What was the um, address again, Erin? 3, 325 Sunderland Road. Okay, uh, motion to approve the emergency certification at um, 325 Sunderland Road. Can I second that? Yeah, thanks, Cameron. Seconded. Voice vote, uh, Alex. Oh, you're muted, Alex. Sorry. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. So. Yeah. That's unanimous with Cameron, Alex, Laura, and Jen. Wonderful. And I do see that um, Jeff Squire has joined from Berkshire Design Group. So um, this is, and again, for those of you who don't know, I'm home with COVID. I'm not prepared. I, <laughs> I'm not prepared because I have been out of the office. Um, 
And um, so if the presentation goes forward, I'm just not prepared within um, conditions for an order of conditions tonight. But definitely, if the commission would like to um, review Jeff's responses to the commission's questions from the last meeting and then close the public hearing, we could be prepared to issue the order at the next meeting. Okay. Um, let me bring Jeff in. Uh, can I do that? Uh oh, did I lose my co-host status? Maybe? Let me re-enlist you. I think when you, I'm gonna. Yeah, when I drop yeah. off. Okay. All right, Jeff, I'm gonna bring you in to the panelist. <clears throat> Hi, Jeff. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, we're struggling along tonight. So <laughs> we, we barely have a quorum and, and Aaron is really being a trooper here. Um, I'm so, so sorry, Aaron. Yes, that's, you are a trooper. Well, apologies in advance. Um, yeah. If she wasn't already the best wetland, conservation <laughs> wetland agent in the history of the universe, then she definitely is now. Um, so Jeff. Yes, I think the outstanding question. So as Aaron just said, we're yep. not prepared to issue an order of conditions, but we could close the public hearing on this and issue an order of conditions at the next meeting on October 26th, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, I think the outstanding question was um, kind of a line of query from Commissioner Alex, who is here, and that mm -hmm. was um, why did the lean to have to be on that side of the house? Mm -hmm. Why is it the proposed size yep. um, that it is. So just along the lines of kind of minimizing um, that impact as much as possible. If you could just fill us in on that, that would be great. Sure. And there were, I think, a couple of other, uh, you know, questions or comments that I, at least I had in my notes that I'd be happy to talk about, um, you know, particularly with the um, owner's willingness to spot treat some of the autumn olive and invasives as, oh, a, that's right. you know, as, yep. a, as a form of treatment for those invasives. Um, was certainly one, um, and so that yeah, I spoke with them. They're certainly willing to um, you know to do that and and okay. you know, do that as part of the plan. Um, and then if I can, I do have I did do a quick sketch showing what a lean to would look like on the other side of the house and show the additional impacts. You know I think the um, and I'm happy to share those with you if you want to give me sharing capabilities. But in general, think, yeah. um, the um, you know combination of a couple of things. The setback, the 15 foot setback is, is pretty tight along that edge of the property. Um, so the lean to, you know, barely, if not, you know, exceeds the, the setbacks on that side. Um, plus getting a driveway across the front of the, you know, front of the property or, you know, somehow else into the lot or into that side of the house creates an additional, I don't know, 580, 600 square feet of disturbance within the buffer zone. And so, um, again, if I, yeah, I don't know whether- You should be able to share, Jeff, your opinion. I, yeah, I don't seem to be able to, to share. At the risk of asking a dumb question, is there a green button at the bottom of your screen that says share screen? And yep. when you and it, press it, nothing happens? It says host disabled participant. Oh, 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 I figured it out. Here we uh, go. There we Ooh. are. Look at that. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So this, um, if everybody can see this plan, this this was the you know what what is proposed. This plan shows uh, if you can see in red that same lean to structure on this side of the house. There's a couple of bump outs, uh, chimneys, and other things that sort of complicate things on that side. This is the 15 foot setback that you can see. So there's a little bit of an encroachment with that. You know, they need at least a minimum of eight feet to be able to get a, a boat in there. Um, then additionally, they would need to get an access, you know, route in there somehow. And seeing as how buffer zone extends almost entirely across the front yard, you know, there's an additional 500, 550 square feet of disturbance and, you know, in, in all, you know, Honesty, this location across the front yard, right next to the neighbor's house, just isn't really the most appropriate location for it. This is really sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, recognize that there are wetlands there, but um, you know this area is already you know lawn and and was was previously disturbed. So you know I think you know 
to be honest, there's probably less disturbance and less um, disruption with with this site versus you know versus all of this um, on the other side. So, plus the addition of Winterberry Holly and Native to act right. as a little bit more of a buffer in the drain. So for me, the addition of you know plus or minus 300 square feet or no, what is the driveway is 550 square feet. Right. That for me justifies putting the lean to on the other side of the house, but I'm interested to hear what other commissioners have to say or any outstanding questions. <clears throat> any questions or comments? No, I agree with that approach, Jim. I think that okay. makes sense. Thanks, Laura. In Sergeant Sizes, what does it say that the the driver would be made of or the path to the other side? This, I think the intent here is to leave what they can as lawn. And it's this is only going to be periodic, you know, I guess biannual access that they'll be that will be needed. So they don't intend to, you know, gravel this or anything under here, you know, I imagine will be either dirt or some sort of you know gravel that'll be under cover anyway. Um, but I don't think there's any intent to really improve. Or, or you know, um, put pavement or anything on this side of the driveway. Okay, thank you. Good question, Cameron. Um, all right. Barring any other questions from commissioners, I think what we should do is have a motion to close the public hearing, um, and then we will revisit this. Um, let me see what time Aaron sent it to me. Um, so you don't need to set a time, Jen. If we close okay. the public hearing, um, okay. we can just do it under other business. Okay, at the we end. don't have to have it as an agenda item. Okay. Yeah. All right. It seems like every time I get a hang of like procedurally what we're most <laughs> there's like some special case that exists. So sorry. Um, all right, Jeff. Okay with you. So fine with me. That's next great. Next meeting we'll issue an order of conditions. Um, so I think we're looking for a motion to close the public hearing for the NOI for Nathan Wilson for the construction of addition to existing garage and lean to structure in the buffer zone to BBW at 30 Castro Lane. And so moved is fine. Uh, so, so moved, so moved. So moved. And that's a, or we need a second, Cameron. All right, so that was, um, Motion by Laura, second by Cameron. Voice vote, uh, Laura. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm also an aye. So it's unanimous. Um, and Jeff, we will issue that, that, those, that OOC at our next meeting on the 26th. Okay, that's great. I appreciate everybody getting to this and uh... Yes, best of luck, Aaron, and I hope you feel better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. All right. Um, in a fun wrinkle, we also have Mark back. Mark, if you can hear me, we have a quorum. Um, so, 7.45. Oh, yeah, we're good. Wait. Oh, that's the last one, 750. Okay, so we just need um, to continue the NOI, right, Aaron, for Wood, Massachusetts, on behalf of BWC Eastman Brook. They requested a continuation to October 26th at 740. Do you want us to do a vote on the continuation? Okay, commissioners, we need a motion to continue the NOI. Um, for the battery energy storage facility in the buffer zone to BBW at 515 Sunderland Road to October 26th at 740. And um, so moved is- so, so moved. And now we need a second. Second. Seconded by Cameron, voice vote. Cameron. Aye. Laura. Aye. Alex. Aye. And I'm also an aye. That's unanimous. Um, all right, 7.52. Mark, I'm gonna bring you in as a panelist. Hi, Mark. Hello. Um, so apologies, I'm glad you're back. 
Um, we are working with the Bare Bones Commission tonight. Um, we do have a quorum. We have four members. Um, but as I'm sure you're aware, Aaron is very sick and just hanging in here. Um, so she has not had time to do the staff review of um, your project as proposed. Um, so we have a couple options. We can wait until the next meeting on October 26th when Aaron will have gotten to complete a staff review. And at that point, you could present the project. We can take public comment. We can take commissioners' comments and we'll have the benefit of Aaron's full review and um, potentially more information from you to move that forward. Or um, we could kind of split that and you could do a presentation now on the project as proposed. We could take public comment, take any commissioner comments kind of off the cuff, um, but we would have to continue in order to hear staff review of the project on October 26th um, in either case. So it's it's up to you. Um, I can do a presentation of where the current revised project is and if we could ask the commission and Aaron if she can send us any comments that she has as soon as possible. That way we can work on those because I know Kyle needs to have this project in front of the planning board in November. So he's really hoping to get a vote or a letter from the commission to the planning board about this project. Um, okay. Um, okay. So just so you know, in that next meeting, um, in our next meeting, we will still have to keep the public hearing open and take public comment. And because hopefully at that point, we'll have more of our commissioners, they will have been able to listen to this meeting and come up to speed and they could have questions too. So you just have to be prepared to talk about the project again, the following. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'll... okay. Alex, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> If the two commission members that are not here miss this presentation, under the rules, they will have missed one uh, meeting. Does that mean they cannot vote on this project when that comes? No, they can miss up to one meeting. So they have to come up to speed. They have to literally watch the meeting, watch the hearing. Um, and come completely up to speed, either by watching this recorded meeting or reading the minutes um, in order to vote. Thank you. Project, yeah. Good question. Um, but Fletcher and Michelle and Andre were here the last time we talked about this, and I think they've been in attendance the time before as well, so we should be okay. All right, um, Mark, take it away. You guys see my screen? Yep. So Archipelago is proposing to raise the existing sorority house that's located at 47 Olympia and construct a five-story dormitory style apartment complex. Um, there's BVW located, well, located off property within the conservation land. Um, this would be how the proposed building would fit into the property and the adjacent um, 57 Olympia. As you can see, this is the 50 foot no work zone. This is the 75 foot no building. And this is the 100 foot. Um, only a portion of the building falls within the 75 foot um, no building zone. And it's approximately like 60 feet away from the BVW. Um, as you can see, if you look to the north or to 57, the um, existing building is quite closer to the BVW. Um, <clears throat> for drainage, I can walk you through the plan. Um, right now, we're proposing that the roof <clears throat> stormwater gets. Um, collected and directed to two retainer systems on the eastern side of the building. Um, the first retainer system would be an infiltration unit and the lower um, 12 unit retainer structure would be a detention based system. 
Um, this was due to the soil test that I conducted on site. We found sugarloaf oak hoofs um, within the lower area, which would prevent infiltration. So instead of trying to infiltrate there, I decided to just retain that. And then it out flows to a little small um, stormwater garden before um, flowing over a concrete curb level spiral. Um, the driveway, the drive aisle gets collected into two deep sump catch basins and then ran through an oil water separator before being routed to another retainer system within the courtyard. The sidewalk drainage and the courtyard all gets collected to the retainer system within the courtyard that gets discharged to the um, municipal drainage system. We are proposing to use um, double erosion control, so fiber roll and silt fence around the eastern part of the site, and then just fiber roll along the northern and southern edge with filter sock on the deep sock catch basin inlets, and then um, filter sock and gravel bag inlet protection for the area drains within the courtyard. And then we propose on all of the newly created slope on the eastern side to have erosion control matting laid down to prevent erosion. Uh, this is the <clears throat> proposed landscaping plan. Um, it's only a draft at this, oh, as of now, as I've made a comment to the landscape architect, uh, but we're planning on having native trees planted and um, shrubbery planted out on the eastern side and a pollinator seed mix planted all the way on the banks to make up for the impacts to the um, wetland buffer zones. If the commission has any questions. What percentage of the BBW on the lot is being impacted by the building as proposed? By the building itself? By the proposed work. Um, the 87% of the um, post, well, 87% of the buffer zone that's on the property would be getting impacted and only out of that, which is six, like 6,200 square feet. And of that 6,200 square feet, only 2,000 of it building. Um, so the rest of it would be replanted with the pollinator mix and with the um, natural trees, so, so, native trees. So just, so, just so I'm clear, so out of the 6,200 square feet impacted, only 2,000 square feet of that is building. The rest is plantings and so forth. Correct. Do you have a detail of what specifically, you know, what specific native plants you intend on using? And if you don't, can you provide that? Um, I believe this was sent to Erin uh, at the beginning of the week, but she's been out sick. So, I'll have the landscape architect revise this again, and then we will send it back to Aaron for review. But this would be the schedule of what would be planted on the eastern part of the project. And Aaron, I mean, Laura, I think you probably, I don't know if you can see this, but basically it's a list of it looks like majority native, but yeah, Mark, for your benefit, it would have to be native plants and trees. Some some of those some of those don't look like they're native, based on my low bush fern, hay scented fern. I'm not the expert, um, but certainly Aaron's review can reveal that. So unfortunately, we're just gonna have to wait until our next meeting to discuss that further. Um, I see Dave has a thanks, Laura. I see Dave has a question. Um, yeah, and I, I may not articulate this well, but again, it sounds like we're going to have to redo this presentation in two weeks anyway, but 
I was curious, Mark, you mentioned a connection to the municipal stormwater system. And I was curious, could you say a little bit more about that? And I, I guess I was maybe, I'm not sure if I'm thinking incorrectly, but, but could you say a little bit more about that? So the way the drainage is proposed on the site is the roof drains or the stormwater from the roof and the stormwater that falls on the eastern portion of the site will be drained or will head into the, the existing direction that it's already going, which is towards the east. Mm -hmm. um, the courtyard and the traveled access alley will all be collected in storm, underground stormwater system and retained and uh, infiltrated, or well, some of it will be infiltrated, and then the remaining would be discharged to the municipal system. Okay. So we, what, was, what was attempted was a balancing of the site. So the stormwater is even, well, equals the existing conditions, the existing runoff conditions offsite. Mm -hmm. And has that been reviewed by the town engineer? Um, I yeah. do not believe so yet. Okay. It would be, I don't remember if the, I would have to inquire with Kyle if they wanted yeah, the planning board's going to review that. Well, it's going to be part of the planning board review. Yeah, okay. No, I'm just, again, this is the first time I've seen this. I I think I was not present maybe for the last meeting. So I'm just yeah putting it out there that I think, you know, like to hear more about what, that. So, Dave, yeah. what's, the, what's the likelihood of the planning board looking at this and then send, you know, if there's revisions, they would then have to send it back to us, correct? If, it, if there's changes in the in the conservation or the buffer zones. Yeah, so that's that's kind of um, case by case basis, Laura. So if like hypothetically we were to issue a permit with an order of conditions and the planning board then required revisions to the plan that were significant enough that our permit and order of conditions needed to be revised, then we would go through that process similar to the Southeast Commons project, if you remember. Got it, yep, I um, do. But it's all a matter of kind of like timing. Um, and this has not, I mean, this again, this has not gone through our town staff review, not to mention with a town engineer, but Dave's comment makes me um, say that I think that if Jason Skills could review this, I think we would benefit from that. So to the extent that, um, we can ask that, and I can't see. Oh, Aaron, I see now that you have your hand up. I think Aaron, Aaron, I know Aaron knows a lot about how these stormwater management plans have to come about. I think, you know, I'm struggling a little bit with the technical details, but I thought all the water had to be retained on site. And personally, I would love to see a design where the stormwater management plan, the stormwater infiltration and detention basins are not in literally the buffer. Um, but Aaron, I want to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so the the plan changed pretty dramatically um, from the last version that that um, was originally submitted. Um, you guys might recall I had like two pages of comments on the plan, so they turned around some revisions really quickly um, and also the test pit data that they got back. It looked like there was even additional changes made based on those mm -hmm. um, and so you know, that's wonderful. And that's why we require test pits right there because the proposed infiltration area wouldn't have functioned because there wasn't adequate, um, the soils weren't adequate for infiltration in that location. Um, I've asked Jason to comment on this one um, okay. specifically. And my, I, um, in the original application, the original submission, there was only 25% TSS removal for the impervious surfaces at the front of the building um, prior to being discharged into the town 
um, store, store, uh, stormwater system. Stormwater system yeah. yeah. And I know, Mark, you had you had made an adjustment. I think you added a more technic unit at the front. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? And one of the questions I had looking at the plans, which if you could just confirm is, is there only one treatment train for all of the water on those infiltration, on those um, impervious surfaces? There's there's one treatment train that's going through multiple systems or, or is there multiple trains and different systems for each train? Could you just, talk about those really quickly before the water gets into the municipal system so we can understand that a little bit better. So the area that's going to have your salt and all the chance of oil and grit mostly is going to be the access drive to the storage area and trash. That's going to be collected, or well, the stormwater that falls on that is going to be collected in deep sump catch basins and then routed through an oil water separator, which then will route the water to a uh, retain it infiltration structure. And um, that infiltration, oh, that retain it system is designed to match or equal or be below the um, existing runoff to Mathos Drive. Um, that existing retainer system gets you like 80% for the walks, and we have an additional 44% for the drive with the deep sump hedge basins in the oil water separator. Are there two separate treatment trains for the stormwater at the front of the site? It's, well, those, kind of the driveway has its own but it ties into the same one for the overall which is the retain it system so what you're saying is the driveway catches in ca deep sump catches then goes to oil, oil water, water separator yes, and then that. at that point it ties into the system that captures the runoff from the walkways and the remaining part of the property is that accurate yes. okay yes. I just want to make sure the commission understands sort of the drainage cycle of what's happening. Right. And then there's a separate system off the, I guess, east side of the property, which is the roof Which is drainage. clean roof storm model. Right. Bingo. With this combination infiltration and detention. In, right. And that detention basin is almost entirely in the buffer. Um, um, no, it's only like half in the buffer. Oh, I see. I see. There's the hundred foot. Okay. Yeah. Oh, your foot's like right here. But it does drain to that storm water. What did you call that? I can't read the um, right. A <laughs> storm water garden. Yep. With, okay. Yep. Which is the low point of the site where the water existingly discharges from. Okay. Alex, I see you have a question. Yeah. There's uh, on page three of six. And on the, um, the north side, um, the water comes down this um, next to the building. And as you get close to the project boundary, there's no mark on the, on the drawing that says that water is being controlled. And that leads me to believe that it's just gonna continue down the hill off the property. And could you, uh, arrange for that water to come around the corner and down to you have a storage tank or you have uh, that brown the, the, the black thing um, right next to the boundary yeah right there that's so, the, that's as, the storm water garden yeah so the, um, your mark your landscape architect or whoever drew it has the water flowing along the bound along the building until it gets to, uh, I've forgotten what the scale is here, 20 feet equals, an inch equals 20 feet, so that it's about a little more than 20 feet to the edge of the um, building. And all that water that's coming along won't be guided around the corner to the basin. And could you correct that? So that the water, water doesn't leave, so the water doesn't leave the property. The water naturally goes that way. It goes down that there's a this is all sloped down from this corner and it 
naturally swirls around the building. Yeah, so see, Alex, it, um, there's a high point right where Mark has his cursor, and it would drain kind of in a southeasterly direction there into the stormwater garden, if you look at those total yeah. lines. Yeah, I, um, I, have hard, I, have hard, I have a hard time imagining that, and all I'm asking is that they can put something on the drawings that shows that they are, in fact, causing the water to turn the corner to the basin. Yeah. Can you zoom in a little bit, Mark, so that we can see the topo better? Because it's really difficult to. Oh yeah, there we go. So at uh, 352, 351, and 350, you've got the water coming along the edge of the building and your arrow shows that it's going from left to right. And uh, regardless of the topo, mm -hmm. it would be nice that the drawing has some instruction for construction that the water needs to turn. You've got an arrow uh, headed towards the boundaries at the water flow, right below 349. There's an arrow. Is that water it's, flow? No, no that's, that's pointing that's to something. Back. That's 10 foot setback, excuse me. Yeah, I spent some time with a magnifying glass looking at the thing. <laughs> um, so that's one request. Um, I'd appreciate it if uh, there was something on there that causes water to turn the corner to the retention basin. So it's not forgotten during construction. And also on a larger, um, the project calls for a very large alteration of the wetland buffer. And um, um, I'm wondering what you can do to give some of that back by either uh, uh, shrinking the building, um, making it smaller. Um, and I, I sort of wondered why we have two buildings with a courtyard. Maybe that's so that each apartment has windows to the outside. Um, but if your buildings were, um, uh, the, the, the distance from one corner on the on the west side, it's all, it's only about twenty feet between buildings, and um, so could you tell me why we how we could give back some of the wetland buffer? And I think if I can just insert some framing of this, I think what Alex is touching on is this kind of a maximum build out scenario where again, 87% of the jurisdictional area on the property is being impacted by the project as proposed. And so it would be great for the next meeting if you could be prepared with a little bit of kind of um, the scenario planning you did or will do in the future to reduce the impact to the jurisdictional area on the property. Um, and that's in addition to, it sounds like a lot of commissioners raising concerns about flow of water off the site towards the conservation area. Thanks, Jen. That said much better than me. No, that's, that's, we're all pulling in the same direction here. I'm just trying to, Mark, I'm trying to give you clear, actionable um, kind of information to come back to the commission with. And Cameron, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Um, I had a bit of a similar question. If I'm interpreting it right, the building that's currently there, is that going to be knocked down? Correct. Yes. And that has a bigger portion of it up against the, uh, the in the buffer zone? No, that's the adjacent building to the north. Okay, so. So that, that white one, Cameron, that you can see is existing and then drop down to the middle structure, that's the one that's existing. And that one's completely out of the buffer. Okay, so, okay, so the proposed buffer. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, good questions. But the but Cameron, to your question, the building is going from a, a small structure outside of the buffer to a very large structure encroaching on the buffer. I think that's kind of what what you are trying to understand. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Um, I see Kyle has a question or has his raised hand his hand raised. Um, I'm going to bring him in as a panelist. Um. 
Oh, one point I did want to make, and I'm sorry I didn't <clears throat> before <laughs> Kyle speaks, is that Kyle did send me a housing plan document um, from the town of Amherst, which I didn't distribute to the commission. And the reason was just because it's, you know, for the Conservation Commission, we can't look at a housing plan in terms of rendering decision based on wetlands impacts. But I just wanted yeah. to make sure that for the record that that Kyle did send that along to me. Um, I can provide that to the commissioners if you're interested in reading it, just that for the sake of decision making relative to the Conservation Commission performance standards, that it's not something that we can consider. And I'm going to say this in another way as well, if you'll just allow me, Erin, I think this is one of those situations where ideally we would look at this from a more holistic planning standpoint. But unfortunately, that's not the position we're in here at the commission. Um, we have to deal with our jurisdiction um, and review the proposed project with, from the lens of protecting the wetland and water resources in Amherst. So that's why um, the focus on stormwater management and um, reduction of impact to the jurisdictional area on the, on the site is, is our main focus, um, for better or worse. Uh, sorry, Kyle. Um, so I think you're here. Okay. Yep. Hi, Kyle. Did you have a question Hi. or comment? Uh, no, and you guys both touched on what I was going to speak to, which is that, you know, this is one acre within 17,000 acres of Amherst. Um, it's the one acre that is owned RF, that is privately owned, that is a tax paying parcel uh, that supports the type of housing that our community very much needs. So um, we as developers have to operate at all of these scales. We understand your purview and the scale at which you need to operate. I just need to wave my hand and say, you know, it's important if we're going to achieve the housing objectives that we have to build housing where we can. Uh, I think Mark, the site lends itself very well to this type of housing. Um, I think the work that Mark has done to manage this redevelopment project and um, uh, do better than uh, what we've done uh, five, six years ago north of here on the property next door is, is great. Um, and I appreciate the work he's done. I appreciate the work you guys are doing. And um, I'm hopeful that we can satisfy all the objectives as we try to uh, improve this site and um, uh, in, um, better, the, better the wetlands uh, and the buffer zone and uh, build the housing we need. Yeah, thanks. Um, heard loud and clear. Um, so I think on that vein, commissioners, um, given that, you know, we really need to give Aaron and hopefully Jason, um, the town engineer, a chance to provide a review of the stormwater management plan and everything else going on the site. I just want to give you one more chance to ask any specific questions or flag any more information you need from Mark to make, to move forward with this, this application. So, um, so he has a clear path here. We can't um, just disagree <laughs> because it's a, a large building. In no. the we have to give it yeah. something to work with. No, I yeah. think um, what, what's been said makes sense, Jen, but I, I am really looking forward to seeing Aaron's review of, of the plan. So I feel like that's yeah. a pretty criti critical missing piece. 100%. Yep. And, um, and Mark. I know you've done everything you can um, to respond to comments and get things moving. And unfortunately, this is the time we live in where um, we're a little bit stopped dead in our tracks with, with Aaron um, out, knocked out, sick. Um, and, and from my perspective, I just would like to say that we really appreciate the fast moving responses to the comments because a lot of applicants don't do that. Um, we've waited months and months for revisions with open hearings. So we do appreciate the fact that you're making a tremendous effort to respond quickly and, and take the action necessary to address comments and make revisions that. Um, yeah, agreed. The fact that you have, you know, percent area of jurisdictional, you know, percent of jurisdictional area data available, just the amount of detail you have on these plans, there's nothing um, left to question. It's just that we have to complete our staff review. Um, I will say one thing about the buffer area that's on site. 
Um, and I'm sure Erin noticed this when she was out on a site walk. It's not, it's very overgrown with ivy and the trees are being suffocated. So I feel like us cleaning that area and replanting within the buffer area with pollinating plants and native trees will substantially help and increase the um, livelihood of the wetland buffer within the property. I can confirm that there is substantial poison ivy. Yeah, out there. <laughs> I think I that's right a, it. yeah. I think that's a question that science hasn't answered. Like, what is the quality of the buffer ne necessary, right, to protect um, our wetland resources? But a agreed and point taken, Mark, that that native plantings and removal of invasives could be valuable for this site. Um, okay, so with that, I want to briefly take public comment, um, just because we have some real diehards who have been here throughout this, um, and I want to give them a chance to ask any questions or make any comments, um, if it's about this hearing, and then what we'll do is we need a motion to continue this, um, we'll go from there. So if you're here in attendance um, as a member of the public and you have a question or a comment about the proposed project at 47 Olympia Drive, please raise your hand. Not, not seeing anything. All right, um, so I think we have a plan. Uh, I th and I think what we need at this point is um, commissioners uh, motion to continue the notice of intent um, SB associates on behalf of Archipelago Investments at, and 47 Olympia Drive LLC for redevelopment of 47 Olympia Drive. Um, we need a motion to continue to. You can say 750, Jen, because we okay. were able to close the other hearing. So. Okay. Okay. Um, to seven to October 26th at 7:50 p.m. Motion to continue um, 47 Olympia Drive LLC for October 26th, 7:50 p.m. Seconded. Okay, that's Laura with the motion. Cameron seconded. Voice vote. Alex. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm also an aye. So that's unanimous. Mark, Kyle, thank you for your time and, and effort on this. Um, we will keep it moving to the best of our abilities. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. So that's it um, for our agenda. I think we should call it. Um, Alex, thank you for being here. Um, I know <laughs> that you are also probably not feeling, as you said, tip top. So um, as you've witnessed, if you hadn't been here, we wouldn't have been able to move either of those hearings forward at all. So thank you for that. Um, and Laura, shout out as always, because um, you are always on the road and always doing your best to call in. Um, so I really appreciate that, especially in this instance. <laughs> um, and again, Aaron, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> we yeah, feel really better. appreciate you. I um, feel better it, to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And Dave, thank you for keeping us updated. <laughs> um, and with that, I think we just need a motion to adjourn. Uh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> At I second. I second. And that's a second from Alex. Voice vote, Alex. Yes. Laura. Aye. Cameron. I and I'm also an I unanimous Aaron get better thank you I'm getting there, getting there. all right all right thank you guys have bye, a great everyone. night good night all bye, bye. thanks everyone